She was a world-famous scientist, loved by the American nation. Her importance within American anthropology was huge. She was one of the people who helped to create it. She made sure that when she was in a room, you knew she was there and who she was. There was never a topic on which she wasn't willing to say a few words on education, on family life, on sexuality. She was an oracle. She had something to say about absolutely everything. He was the Australian loner, forever walking in her shadow. In his childhood, he'd been brought up in a messiah cult by his mother to think he would be the next messiah. He seemed to know everything and made you feel like you didn't know everything. He was scary. He was a scary person to sit next to. You were either his friend or you were his enemy. For almost 20 years, these two people's supporters would be locked together in the most vitriolic of struggles. A battle for the very heart and soul of anthropology. The public likes to see figure, their, 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 their giants fall. They love to see that. It's a little bit like the assassination of John Lennon. When you have achieved that kind of recognition, there's going to be someone that wants to smash it. This is the story of anthropologists Margaret Mead and Derek Freeman, and the crucial role they played in perhaps the biggest debate in all of science. The question of whether humans are the products of nature or nurture. <gasps> In November 1987, two Australians, one an anthropologist, the other a documentary filmmaker, found themselves on a tiny island in the South Pacific, listening to the 60-year-old story of a woman called Fa'a Pu'a. When I met this woman and she told the story, it didn't sink into me immediately. You know, I was just concentrating on getting that story on, on film. It wasn't until the old lady had finished her tale that the two men realized just what they'd witnessed. After we'd done the interview with uh, the lady, um, it sank in that evening as to what we'd got in my, in my mind. I knew what we had then and how important it might be. Because if what Fa'a Pua had told them was true, then the reputation of probably the most famous anthropologist in the world was based on a lie. And if this was the case, then the entire school of anthropology she'd done so much to establish was also nothing more than a fantasy. The woman whose reputation was under threat was none other than Margaret Mead, known to millions of Americans from her countless books, magazine articles, and television appearances. At the time of her death, she was America's first woman of science and among the three best-known women in the United States. Born on December the 16th, 1901, into a middle-class family from Philadelphia, the young Margaret Mead grew up in an atmosphere of academic inquiry. As a child, I knew, of course, that women used their brains and did things because my mother and my grandmother had done so. And I knew that marriage and children and using your brains weren't incompatible. She grew up in, in a family of intellectuals who were concerned uh, about social justice. Her father was an economist. Her mother was a sociologist. And they read, they commented, and they were involved. But Mead's left-leaning upbringing contrasted sharply with the politics of the country into which she'd been born. A hundred years ago, the United States was well on the way to becoming the world's first superpower. Millions of immigrants from across the globe 
had provided America with an almost limitless supply of cheap labor, eager to sign up to the American dream. But while this migrant tide brought America enormous wealth, it also gave rise to something else. Well, in the 1920s, there was a strong undercurrent of racism in American society. There was a belief that cultural differences derived from innate biological genetic uh, components. And uh, this was manifested in policies that restricted severely certain groups of people on the grounds that they were genetically and biologically and socially and intellectually and morally inferior. And there was no greater sign of this genetic inferiority than the color of one's skin. This racism even had its supporters in the world of science, in particular, the field of anthropology. Because for as long as anthropologists had been studying other societies, many of them had come to associate dark skin with savagery. There'd always been a racist wing of anthropology. Um, and this uh, reached its culmination in the eugenics movement, some of whom were geneticists within anthropology who endorsed this hereditarian position. Back then, the concept of nurture was barely developed, and what was important was the concept of nature. But nature didn't mean human nature. Nature meant race and racial variation. In other words, there was a powerful branch of anthropology that endorsed the belief widely held in American society back then, that being white made you superior to everybody else on the planet. And since being white was all down to one's genes, there was nothing anyone not white could do to change this. But not everyone shared this view. Since 1899, the anthropology department at New York's prestigious Columbia University had been run by a man called Franz Boas, himself an immigrant to the United States. Franz Boas was responsible for an enormous shift in anthropological thinking away from nature towards nurture, the idea that human capabilities were formed as much by society and history and culture as they were by genetic inheritance. One aspect of human development that particularly interested Boaz was adolescence. In the 20s, adolescence was seen as, as they were in the 60s and other decades as a problem. And Boaz wanted to show that adolescence was a cultural construct. It was something that varied according to the uh, society and the family life in which the adolescent grew up. Boaz argued that if the storm and stress experienced by adolescents was purely down to nature, then it should be found in all teenagers across the globe. But if there existed just one society where adolescence was stress-free, then it would prove that nurture also had a role to play. To find such a society, Boaz turned to one of his students a promising 23-year-old post-grad, Margaret Mead. Boaz was extraordinary in his era in the support that he gave to talented women. I think he noticed that the anthropology done by men who were fascinated with chiefs and warfare and, and titles and things like that missed a great deal that was going on. He chose me to do this study because she was virtually an adolescent herself. She was in her early 20s. She was small. She was very slim at the time. She looked girlish. And he thought that she could carry off a study anthropologically in a radically different part of the world. The only question was exactly which part of the world. Franz Boas had the perfect location in mind. The place Boaz chose to send Mead was Samoa, a small cluster of Polynesian islands in the South Pacific, some 1,600 miles northeast of New Zealand. 